Well, that sucks. Anyway, um, <laughs> so in my last news video, I was talking about the rumored release date and then speculating on pricing and performance of the RTX 4070. Uh, I didn't have any actual information on pricing. I just said, you know, I'd be shocked if Nvidia priced it lower than 600 and I expected somewhere in the 600 to $700 range and wasn't too excited about that. And now we're seeing headlines of it's gonna be $749 MSRP. Where is this coming from? Well, I found this article at WCCF Tech. It uh, seems to be that the original source of their information is coming from the YouTube channel, Moore's Law is Dead. Now, uh, I did go ahead and watch that original source video. And what I was actually originally gonna report on this morning uh, is where he started his journey. So I guess, uh, and by the way, we're gonna cover lots of other topics in the video today, lots of tech news, but uh, let's definitely begin with this. I think you guys will be pretty interested. Um, so basically what happened is at videocards.com, they did a follow-up on the release date for the RTX 4070, which we had seen leaked as April 13th. And they were able to follow up with this document. So what is this document and why am I in the way? Ah! Um, okay. So what they've got here is basically saying that the product will be announced on April 12th at 6 a.m. Pacific time. So that right there is kind of putting a quash on the... Uh, uh, a lot of us had expected to maybe hear about this at like game, like GDC, GTC, um, this month in March, uh, cause Nvidia had some keynote hap speech happening there. Well, it's looking like the product announcement will actually be on April 12th. Uh, and then it's looking like there's going to be two different review dates. There's the, um, reviews of MSRP only cards on April 12th and then the reviews on non-MSRP cards on April 13th with the on-shelf sale date on April 13th. Now, this looks uh, a little suspicious then, right? Because it's like, okay, now, now I'm, I'm gonna say that like, they do sometimes have two dates, right? Where you have the Founders Edition and then the non-Founders Edition coming in a day later, sometimes on launch day. So this is not uh, completely unheard of. Although the way, the way this is phrased as MSRP only versus non-MSRP is a little bit interesting. So I guess what happened uh, going back to this thing is Moore's Law is dead, uh, you know, look, reached out to sources to try to confirm the accuracy of this information from videocards.com and says he was not only able to confirm this information, he actually got the, the pricing that's being thrown around to AIB partners as well. And he says from multiple of his most trusted and reliable sources, they're saying that the pricing being thrown around by Nvidia to the, to board partners is $749.99. Um, and that this could be possible pressure to try to get them to keep cards somewhat in line with that MSRP because that's pushing up so close to the $800 MSRP of the 4070 Ti. Um, so that's where that's coming from. And then Moore's Law is that is also very uh, careful to point out that pricing at this point, a month ahead of launch, could change. And I would absolutely agree with that. Remember that the, uh, the 4070 Ti, which was originally going to be a 4080 12 gigabyte, not only had its name changed, but its price adjusted from 900 to 800 um, shortly before launch. So, um, in other words, Nvidia could still maybe, you know, gauge the reaction of, of people to this pricing and decide that it needs to be a bit lower. But I would say that if they're already throwing around $749.99, um, I'd be shocked if we now actually got anything under $700. So I would say 4070 Ti, if that's 800, um, it's sounding like it's gonna be 700, 750 at least, I would expect for the 4070. And that I think is extremely disappointing for people, especially if we jump over to the specs, which I've already talked about. Now, to be clear, these are rumored specs and Moore's Law is Dead also mentioned in his video that he could not get confirmation of this coup de corps count. Uh, he's, he also didn't get people saying it wasn't true. He just has not been able to confirm that. Anyway, just throwing that out there. But the current rumors that have gotten out there about the 4070 is that it is a lot fewer CUDA cores than the 4070 Ti. And so performance of this thing, um, 
being somewhere in the 75 to 85 percent range, you know, maybe 90 percent range of the 4075. I mean, uh, it does have this the same kind of memory specs, right? Uh, but it is rumored to have lower clock speeds and a lot fewer CUDA cores. We'll have to see what happens. But if NVIDIA feels like the performance of this is actually pretty close to 4070 Ti, um, you know, they might just not want to offer a better deal than the 4070 Ti. They might want to give you the same price to performance. And if they give you the same price to performance and it performs, you know, 20% worse than a 4070 Ti, then they might cut the cost by 20%. If it performs 10% worse, cut the cost by 10%. You see what I'm saying? And so if they're planning to price it right there, oh man, I, I just hate this though, guys. This is so disappointing. Um, also again, if that's the MSRP, then I think, uh, you know, we're definitely gonna get board partner cards that cost $800, or, you know, $789, you know, like, Ah, oh, this is just so frustrating. Now, I don't have a lot of other actual information other than uh, other than that. And again, these are just rumors at this point in time. Uh, you could go ahead and watch the original source video for Moore's Law is Dead. All my sources will be linked in the description. So I was hoping to report there's some sort of good sign on GPU pricing here. I am seeing this article from videocards.com saying that the RTX 4090's Founders Edition price in Europe is now down to... Well, a lot of money, $1,819, although the only good news there is that it is now 7% cheaper than its original MSRP. Um, however, I will also mention that if you just look at how the Euro has strengthened versus the dollar um, since launch, I think that might explain it. So is this actually a, a discount <laughs> or is this just a, a currency correction? Now, let's just move on to some other topics. How about this? In my last news video, I was very excited about the Asus motherboard that had all the connections on the back. Well, this is an MSI motherboard, photos being leaked on Billy Billy, but reported here by videocards.com, of them with a, with a board with all those connectors on the back. And I think that's really cool. And it looks like, um, that this is going to be a more common, uh, you know, choice. And it's looking like we now have Maxun, Asus, and MSI uh, all now involved in this. Uh, pro pro Did I say Maxun? Isn't that Maxun? Uh, I don't know, guys. It's early in the morning. Anyway, <laughs> for me, anyway. Um, anyway, I really like this idea of the, of the motherboard connectors on the back. Um, just be careful with the cases being compatible and having cutouts in the right locations and all of that if you're going to go that route. But I think that's cool. I like to see that. Another thing I just want to throw out really quickly that I think is cool is this PCIe 4.0 card hosts 21 M.2 SSDs and could support up to 168 terabytes of storage at 31 gigabytes per second. That's cool. And I know the vast majority of people do not need this. So basically this would be like, uh, you know, this will slot into your PCIe slot uh, like it was a, uh, you know, graphics card type of installation, but you could have a stick a whole bunch of M.2 drives on there. 21 of them apparently. And anyway, let's move on because I know most of you don't need that. What I want to talk about now is AMD talking about the Ryzen 7 7800X 3D and giving us their benchmarks, you know, AMD's own benchmarks, which are obviously going to be a set of games that is selected to show it in the best light possible. Um, and that third-party reviews, I would expect to not show the same performance advantage over its competitors with that out of the way, here's AMD's official numbers. Because when the 7900X3D launched, I was very clear, where's the, I think this is the best graph to look at. Um, I was very clear that the vast majority of people, myself included, should probably just wait for the 7800X3D if the reason you're buying this is gaming. Um, I actually got some pushback in that, uh, in my video saying that, no, the 7800X3D has to perform uh, noticeably worse than the 7950X3D due to it having less cache and less clock speeds. More on that in a second, uh, but let's just look at the uh, information here directly from AMD. 
So in this graph right here, we are seeing the performance compared against the Intel 13900K, and this is the 7900X3D, and we're seeing 13% uh, you know, faster in Rainbow Six Siege, 18% uh, faster in Total War Three Kingdoms, 23% faster in Red, Red Dead Redemption 2, 24% faster in Horizon Zero Dawn. Now, this is kind of interesting in and of itself, although I will say that these are some games that, you know, there are some games that respond better to the increased cash than other games do. And so I think AMD is very clearly selecting some games that respond better to the cash. Remember, in the actual meta-analysis of the 7950X3D um, reviews, it on average came out about 3.8% ahead of the 13900K. So just to rein in um, expectations to what we'll probably see in actual third party reviews, I just wanna mention that. Now, with that in mind, look at this top right hand corner here. This is the 7950X3D um, up against the 13900K, also from AMD. Now, most of these are different games, however, Notice that we do see Rainbow Six Siege in both of these, and they're both 13% faster, indicating that the 7950X3D and 7800X3D would be performing the same in that game. And the other repeat that we have is Horizon Zero, um, I was gonna zoom in and laugh at the spelling mistake, apparently it's not gonna cooperate. Horizon Zero Down. Uh, we clearly uh, would understand this is Horizon Zero Dawn here. Anyway, Horizon Zero Dawn, um, they're reporting a 24% lead over the 13900K with the 7800X3D, and in that same game, reporting a 27% lead over the 13900K uh, on their 7950X3D. And that's the only um, like-to-like -like comparison that we have here. Um, also, they, they show it, so uh, I, mean, I guess I should follow up and, and point out the obvious conclusion there. So it looks like at least in that one game, the 7950X3D is 3% faster than the 7800X3D, which in actual gaming would be completely unnoticeable. That's, that, that's the point there, and this costs a lot less, and again, was tied in Rainbow Six Siege. Now, if we jump down here, they're also showing the 7800X3D versus the 5800X3D, um, and then they're showing the 7950X3D versus the, uh, the 13900K here. So. Uh, these two aren't directly comparable. Like I can't jump and uh, uh, jump between comparisons of the 7950X3D and the 7800X3D. So I'm gonna uh, jump down to this. So this I'm taking this from a Tom's Hardware article. Again, link will be in the description, but they're getting these graphs directly from AMD. Now, here's why people pushed back against me when I said that the 7800X3D in gaming would be basically the same performance as a 7950X3D for $450 instead of $700. The pushback was the clock speeds and the cache. Okay, people say that the 7950X3D clocks to 5.7 and the 7800X3D only clocks to five, and that's a 14% clock speed advantage for the 7950X3D. Yes, but the, the, what I didn't spell out in that video, because I had already done so in previous videos, is that the 5.7 gigahertz clock speeds aren't happening on the cores that have the extra cache. That's happening on the non-cache cores, which is what the 7950X3D is doing. You're getting one CCD that's basically a 7800X3D, and you're getting another CCD, so now you have another eight cores that don't have the extra cache, and then clock higher. That's what's going on here, okay? But in gaming workloads, you usually benefit more from the cache than the clock speed, although there are some games where it's the reverse. And then the advantage of having the 7950X3D is you could you know, choose to enable one CCD or the other. Um, but when you're trying to use both, if you're thinking about using both, there's a latency penalty jumping from, from one CCD to the other. And this also explains why the cache difference here doesn't actually matter. Because even though, yes, the 7950X3D has more total L3 cache, and L2 cache, because it has that other CCD, the extra cache is on the other CCD. So even though I think the cores can access it, due to the latency penalty of doing so, you would not expect a performance increase from that. And in fact, you might get a performance increase from disabling the other CCD, 
uh, to just get the cache cores working, which is what the 7800X3D is. Now I will say it only says it goes up to five gigahertz and here's where I think there will be a possibly 5% or less advantage for the 7950X3D, not 14% which is, you know, if you look at the 5.7 versus 5.0. I was wanting to look into, so how fast are the 3D V-cache cores actually boosting on the 7950X3D? And when I was Googling that, there was a Reddit thread with 7950X3D users actually just discussing that. How fast is your V-cache cores boost? Um, and it's just in the AMD subreddit people, subreddit people talking about it. Um, some people reporting uh, 5.3. Um, others reporting 5.1 to 5.25 max, um, occasionally getting up to 5.3, uh, but the, uh, some people saying they're only getting up to 4.9, um, but other people saying that doesn't sound quite right. So if we're saying 5.1 to 5.3, um, then that's a 2 to 6% clock speed advantage off of this 5.0 on the actual 3D cache cores, uh, which is why, again, I'm I would be surprised if we saw more than a 5% lead for the 7950X3D over the 7800X3D. Now, considering um, that the reviews actually only put the 7950X3D about 3.8% ahead of the 13900K when you looked at a meta-analysis of it, I've reported that on a different video, that would put the 7800X3D probably roughly tied with the 13900K. It's not gonna be that meaningful of a difference, but it's gonna be coming in at $450, which is gonna be a much better price than the 7950X3D or the 13900K. So anyway, let's go ahead and uh, move along here. So speaking of motherboard combos, if you don't want to get the X3D version, um, there have been some decent deals like the one being reported here uh, of a Ryzen 7 7700X with an X670E motherboard and 32 gigabytes of DDR5 6000 memory uh, coming in at $500 combo deal. It didn't look like that combo deal was still available this morning. Um, uh, I did, uh, I kind of save up my browser tabs to, to report until there's uh, enough for a big video. Anyway, uh, in other AMD CPU news, the their Ryzen 7045HX Zen 4 Dragon Range 16 core laptops hit retail starting at $1,800. So these things are not cheap. In previous reporting, I've mentioned that the um, uh, these have been performing very well, uh, like similarly to their Intel uh, counterparts, but at a much better power efficiency, which is especially important in a laptop form factor. Now, why is my browser tab not loading? There we go. We're also seeing Ryzen uh, 5 7640U Phoenix U low power APU spotted in Geekbench. So a lot of you are very interested in the Phoenix APUs. So these are integrated graphics on a mobile chip. And the Phoenix U, the U indicates a, a lower power version of this. Now on Geekbench, it looks like it uh, pr was performing 25% faster than its predecessor as an at least faster. Now videocards.com says that the performance number they're using here is uh, to get that number is the fastest 6600U result up against this one leaked result for this part. So in reality, it might actually even be better if this leaked result isn't as good as it gets. Um, but I thought that was an interesting stat. Now Geekbench isn't really the best test to go off of, but in these pre-release benchmark uh, leaks, you know, you get, you get what you get. Speaking of which, the AMD Radeon 780M RDNA 3 iGPU Another benchmark leaking out showing it faster than this time than a GTX 1650 and RX 480. Uh, but again, I think this is a Geekbench OpenCL score. So I personally don't think the Geekbench OpenCL scores are the most interesting thing uh, to judge performance by. So I'm not really gonna say uh, much more than that, but throw that out there again, all my sources in the description if you wanna take a closer look. Uh, we're seeing AMD's Radeon RX 6300 entry-level RDNA 2 desktop GPU, which officially doesn't exist. There's an RX 6300 mobile GPU, um, but this is apparently on sale uh, at a used parts seller in China, which I guess is known for engineering samples and things like that floating around. So just thought this was interesting to throw out here. The overall stats summarized by videocards.com 
uh, does show it coming in with a 32-bit bus rather than a 64-bit bus on the RX 6400. So significantly cut down there and only with two gigabytes of GDR6 instead of four. So this is um, pretty cut down uh, despite the fact that, um, you know, it it is quite cheap. So it has that going for it. Uh, anyway, um, this is again, still not actually officially launched or anything, but if that's uh, up for sale somewhere, maybe it's, it's on the way or was just an uh, engineering sample. I do want to throw out some interesting testing here at Pharonix, uh, focus on, on Linux performance, that Intel's Arc GPUs were being tested in some open source Linux compute stack uh, performance. So to be clear here, this is Intel Arc GPUs being tested on Linux, not in gaming, but in compute. And while Intel Arc's drivers can hurt them in compute, this is looking at open source drivers on Linux. Um, in com in compute performance, sorry, not in um, not in gaming. Now the uh, I'll, again, I'll link this in the description. You can look at the tests uh, one by one if you're a Linux user and and focused on compute and more interested in this. But overall, it had them performing uh, fairly well. This is the power consumption. Sorry, here's the overall results, which had it at the A770 right up there with an RTX 3060. Again, this is in Linux. I need I need to stress that. Um, and beating some, some competitors like AMD 6700 XT or the RTX 2060. However, when you look at power consumption, that's the main downside versus the, uh, versus the competition there, like the RTX 3060, that kind of thing. Anyway, I know not too many of you are into Linux or Arc GPUs or compute, so I'm not gonna spend too long on that. Although I will mention in other Intel Arc graphics news that ASRock has been cutting price on some of their models. You can now find the Challenger Arc A380 for $120 down from 150. The A750 eight gigabyte version down to $240 from $290. And, um, uh, that's the A758 gigabyte, the ARC A778 gigabyte version at 270 down from 320. So a lot of price cuts on those Intel ARC GPUs. Again, in my recent testing, you get some of my, my further thoughts on that. I still feel like I have more issues with the software, even on the latest drivers, although it's been improving rapidly. So I think it needs to be the, the, the correct fit for the user, whether buying those Intel ARC GPUs does make sense. Now, let's go back to the 12 pin power connectors melting a while ago on RTX 40 series GPUs, especially the 4090. Um, so there's, there hasn't been a lot on that recently, but remember the, the designers of that connector isn't just Nvidia. There's the PCI SIG group that is in charge of that. Intel is part of that group and now, when all of those melting cords uh, were first launching, everybody had their own little pet theory on what was, what was going on. Some people were pointing to the fact that there were different connectors b styles being used on the pins. Some of them were a three dimple pin and some of them were a four spring pin. And um, sites like uh, Igor's lab um, was, is Igor or Igor? I always forget, whatever, anyway. Uh, was blaming this, whereas Gamers Nexus and then Nvidia themselves ended up saying it was actually more of just users connecting it wrong issue. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that Igor was completely wrong about there being a, uh, a better pin design, one over the other. And it looks like Intel believes that the four spring design is better and is suggesting that that be used going forward for high wattage power cable uh, uh, cables for their the uh, graphics cards. Anyway, so I did wanna follow up on that design um, story from a while back. Now let's talk about Steam for a little bit. The Steam Deck OS has a stable release update 3.46, bringing ray tracing support for Doom Eternal. Uh, if you're like, didn't you already report on that? That was a beta version of the Steam Deck OS. This is now on the official release. Now on this note, I wanna talk about the Steam Deck a little bit because um, I really want a Steam Deck with an OLED screen. <laughs> I have a Steam Deck. I love my Steam Deck. I've actually been playing my Steam Deck more than I play on my gaming PC. Uh, lately at least. It kind of depends on what games are out, all, all of that. Um, I've been playing a lot of Hades and Vampire Survivors on my Steam Deck. I don't really need to be, get my big PC out with the 4090 to do that. Anyway, um, it, 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 the point is though, I like OLED screens and the screen on the Steam Deck isn't that great. 
Also, notice I say I've been playing games like Hades and Vampire Survivors on my Steam Deck. Well, the Steam Deck is a very capable machine at playing AAA games. If you have a good gaming desktop, that's really gonna be a better experience for that. So a lot of people are interested in, is there gonna be better hardware coming out, that kind of a thing. For example, uh, uh, Digital Foundry just reviewed some Steam, Steam Deck competitors uh, with the Aeneo 2 slash Geek, uh, which offer significantly better hardware than the Steam Deck. Um, albeit at a higher power consumption range. Um, they go up to eight core 16 thread CPUs with Zen 3 plus architecture instead of Zen 2 with higher boost speeds, 12 RDNA 2 compute units on the GPU instead of eight on the Steam Deck with faster clock speeds, more memory, all of that. So a lot of people are wondering, is, is Valve gonna be updating their Steam Deck? Well, in a lot of uh, recent interviews, the answer is no. Uh, they think that there's a lot of value in keeping one stable, being more like a console for, for developers to worry about. In other words, if there's one stable hardware base that um, they, you know, it's easier for developers to make sure their game works on the Steam Deck and like users feel some confidence that there'll be some kind of long-term support there. Now, uh, in I don't remember if it was this exact article I pulled up, but another, I read a bunch of these recently. They asked specifically about the OLED screen and that's what I was interested in. Um, and unfortunately, the answer to the OLED screen was that not that it was a no, but that making that change is a bigger problem, a bigger hassle, a bigger design uh, process, not as quick and easy is probably the right way of putting it, as the outside user might think. The Valve employee said that um, the, the Steam Deck is really, you know, one thing that's very closely integrated. For example, the Steam Deck, you can change the refresh rate of the screen on the fly through their Steam OS overlay. And that's very useful sometimes when you're trying to target a certain frame rate cap, that kind of a thing. So in other words, the Steam is integrated deeply into the design and the OS. And so just swapping out a screen quickly that wouldn't support all of those same types of features, things like that, is something that they would need to consider. There's also the power consumption issue with, with OLED, um, probably uh, you know further reducing battery life. By the way, if you're curious about this Aeneo 2 slash Geek video, you can watch the Digital Foundry review here. It's very good. Looking at performance, it does perform better in most but not all situations, but the battery life is the main downside. And that's the other thing of, of uh, Valve wants to wait until there's a more meaningful update uh, to performance, probably without also just cranking battery battery life down to zero. Uh, now, speaking of Steam Deck competitors, how about the Nintendo Switch? Uh, I, I would also like an update to the Nintendo Switch. I think a lot of people would, but in a recent interview, the Nintendo of America president believes the Switch still has a few years left, going off of sales, things like that. So in other words, no uh, immediate plan, at least being announced, of any kind of update to the Switch. No, and NVIDIA now has an official driver release rather than just a hot fix, uh, fixing the high CPU usage from their recent driver issues. So NVIDIA recently had driver issues where if, uh, if you exited a game, the NVIDIA container would still be uh, having a high CPU usage even after you've exited the game. And that has now been fixed through a hot fix, but now an official driver's release uh, also has that fix in it right here. Um, so go ahead and download that if you've been uh, experiencing that issue. Now, in a couple of quick little game-related things, how about um, Cyberpunk 2077 HD reworked project is now available for download. Now, to be clear, this is not official update to Cyberpunk 2077. However, I will say that this uh, mod pack is designed by the, by the designer whose work was eventually in, for Witcher 3, was eventually incorporated into the official Witcher 3 next-gen upgrade with ray tracing and all that, um, you know, into the official release of that. So that speaks highly of this mod developer's work. So that's definitely something to, um, to, to be on your radar. And then Nixus is posting a job listing uh, which hints at a possible Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart PC port. To be clear, it's not official. Really, it's if you go off the job listing, there's a certain middleware that's used um, in Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart that is um, being uh, mentioned specifically in the job listing, which is why this would make sense. 
Um, I'm trying to skim the article to get the name of the middleware. I'm totally forgetting the name. Coherent. It's the Coherent middleware. Now, there are several other games that use this, but the main PlayStation exclusive, and Nixus is developing PlayStation, you know, exclusive games to the PC, ports to PC. Um, that, it seems like Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart is the only game that seems to fit that bill. I hope all of you have an excellent day, despite the, uh, ugh, oh, ugh. Oh, mm. Anyway, I still hope you have an excellent day.